Mokulele Airlines is Hawaii's favorite airline and most dependable island hopper. Climb aboard. Your adventure begins with Mokulele Airlines. Win free tickets on Mokulele. Text Mokulele to HNN808 to enter. Mokulele Airlines, the favorite choice to island hop. In 1910, the people of Hawaii witnessed the first powered airplane flight here in the islands. Almost 100 years ago, in October 1913, a Mrs. Newman paid $25 and became the first paying airplane passenger in Hawaii. Her sightseeing tour over Honolulu lasted 15 minutes. Western contact happened here when Captain James Cook discovered Hawaii about 235 years ago. It's believed the first people arrived here over a thousand years before Cook. The Kona coast of Hawaii Island and the village of Kailua was a favorite spot for Hawaiian royalty. The first Christian church built in Hawaii still stands across the street from one of the smaller palaces of Hawaiian kings and queens. The Kona Coast happens to be where the first chapter of our story on Mokulele Airlines begins. This is where retired veteran airline pilot Ron Hansen has chosen to honor the last wishes of his late brother. Ron bought Mokulele Airlines and had hoped to run it alongside of his late sibling. Life is not always fair, and some of the best of us pass on far too early. This little airline reflects the incredible career of Ron Hansen. Safety, efficiency, and customer care are just some of the things Ron requires from his people. Our aircraft are all certified for single pilot operation, but as a, as a retired airline pilot, I recognize the the benefits of more than one set of eyes in the cockpit and even on a nine passenger airplane it's the most important thing is safety and so by uh, having uh, co-pilots on our flights on all of our flights I feel that we've added an extra measure of safety and these young people are all getting the experience they need so if they do choose to go on or apply with the larger airlines uh, that you know the jets uh, they'll have the experience that that they need to to be considered for a job the headquarters of mokulele airlines is located in kona and if you had to describe the feel or personality of this business, it's definitely neighbor island, small town kind laid back. In fact, the person that created and started this airline is a Hawaiian woman whose family is firmly rooted to this island and coastline. She's been an inspiration to many in this community and her people. And I said, I want to be a pilot. I want to be a pilot. And back in the day, there was only one female pilot for Aloha Airlines. Female pilots were um, not very common. And so it seemed like one of those lofty goals. But my husband looked at me and he said, um, go for it, baby. You can do anything you want. So I, so I started flying. I started taking flying lessons. I uh, would work the midnight Aloha Airlines freighters and finish work in the morning and hop on a jet to Maui to learn how to fly and get my pilot's license. Commercial rating when I was up high with my first baby. Flight instructor, uh, instructor rating when I was up high with my second baby. I started teaching people how to fly. I started off with a little Cessna 150, little two passenger airplane on at the Kona airport. And I remember going to my mom saying, well, I'm gonna start this little flight service. What should I call it? I want it to be Hawaiian, but I want it to not be so long and drawn out that people don't know how to pronounce it. And she simply looked at me and said, Mokulele, air service, flight service, that's what it is. And I went, oh, that's right, yeah, mommy. Mokulele's airplane, okay. Kavehi has since left aviation and is mentoring an array of businesses and running several of her own. She spends much of her time in Holuoloa, once the center of commerce on this coast and now a thriving arts center. She was very proud of what she started. And of course, I'm very fortunate to be the beneficiary today to be involved with Mokalele because it's, it's uh, after doing all the things that I've done in aviation, this is, this is the best in aviation for me. I, I recognize what, uh, what an opportunity it is to be a CEO of a little airline flying between the islands, carrying thousands of people every month uh, between the islands. Uh, I have no uh, 
no goal to go into bigger aircraft or go anyplace else in the world. I've done it all and this is the best place to be. In 1920, former World War I pilot Charlie Fern flew the first commercial inter-island flight. He took off from Kapilani Park and flew to Maui. His only passenger paid $150 for the round trip. Charlie later went on to build Kauai's first radio station and owned the Garden Island newspaper. He lived to be 102 years old. Okay, how about curious? The gentleman accompanying Ron Hansen is local boy Daryl Grace. He was born and raised in the Honau Now area of Kona. After a successful college football career, Daryl went on to get his master's degree in commercial pilot's license. He is the general manager of Mokulele Airlines. Flying Mokulele has its pluses. Anyone traveling inner island in Hawaii these past few years knows about the flight limitations of some of our larger carriers. Kona to Kahului, Maui, can happen on one short direct leg several times a day on Mokulele. On other carriers, you might have to go all the way to Honolulu in order to get to Maui. I was born in Minnesota on a, in a small farming community. I grew up on a farm and uh, learned to fly in the Air Force. One of my assignments was at Hickam Air Force Base in Hawaii 52 years ago. 1965, I was hired by Braniff. I was uh, I started flying out of Dallas uh, on Convairs and Electras and other many other aircraft types. So I had an airline career with Braniff for almost 20 years, and then when Braniff ended, uh, was one of the captains that was recruited by Hawaii Express, which was a startup 747 operation out of L.A. flying between L.A. and Honolulu. And uh, so I was flying to Hawaii again. Mokulele also has more daily flights out and into Kahului, Maui than all of the other airlines. They also serve small isolated communities like Hana. Recently, it seemed like half of Hana came out to greet their inaugural flight. You know, my dream of being a pilot was something way beyond what I thought was possible as a teenager in Minnesota. And so it just opened a whole new world. And of course, Hawaii had always been a dream to come here. When back in the, in the 60s, Michener had written a book called Hawaii. And I, I, was, I remember reading it when I was on the flight over here in the Air Force. Um, back in those days, the, the, it was about a 12 hour flight on a prop airplane from, from California. And so, I read the book Hawaii and I found Hawaii to be everything that Michener said it was. It's the most beautiful place in the world. So I've always come back here over the years. It's always been a dream to, to uh, stay involved in Hawaii. Uh, Hawaii is like a, the most beautiful place. And every time when you're flying from the cockpit, you have that view of, of these beautiful scenes. Uh, passengers have that opportunity also, but more so in the cockpit, you can see everything and so it's just an eye it's a pleasure to be able to see all these things as a pilot and unfortunately most of us pilots we you know we maybe have that we do this in the beginning of our career and then we go off and fly jets all over the world and you end up in places you don't want to be and 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 you know you long for being able to fly back you know between the islands so it's just a, a real pleasure to fly here and the weather's always great never a problem. You don't have to worry about bad weather. Smaller airlines provide employment for residents in rural areas across the U.S. They also cover transportation voids that many major airlines choose not to fill. The cost of living in Hawaii is way up there nationally, especially on the neighbor islands. So having options when flying inner island is much appreciated. Every flight is a, is a, like a photographic or scenic flight because uh, we have large windows, every seat has a window. Uh, nine passenger or less aircraft are not subject to TSA inspections. So when you fly in Mokalele out of all the airports except Honolulu, uh, you're not subject to the TSA inspections. Uh, you can arrive a few minutes before departure and get on the flight. 
As we mentioned earlier, this is just the beginning. Throughout the rest of the year, we'll bring you more stories about Mokulele Airlines, their people, and the places they fly to. Mahalo. Thank you for joining us on this episode of Outside Hawaii. We'd like to send a special mahalo out to Ron Hansen, Daryl Grace, and Dave Berry of Mokulele Airlines. Aloha, ahuiho, malama Hawaii. Traveling inter-island can get pretty expensive. For folks with families, it can be very tough flying to a neighbor island for a family event or vacation. Mopulele Airlines provides a more affordable option. It's not for everyone, but there are several perks. Except for on Oahu, you don't have to go through TSA, and on several neighbor islands, parking is free. <laughs> Most air travelers in Hawaii today can barely remember or have never experienced flying with an airline that really treats their customers like friends and family. The bulk of Hawaii's population is about 1.4 million and is centered on Oahu. It's safe to say that the lazy, laid-back ways of 50 years ago are nearly gone. Long commutes on crowded roads are the norm. Enduring long lines and security checks are a way of life. To folks in rural areas like Waimea on the Big Island, where this inaugural Mokulele flight was taking place, the employees of Mokulele are in fact caring for the traveling needs of friends and family. Well, it saves a lot of driving to Kona to, or to Hilo to catch a flight to uh, the other islands. Uh, we have two flights a day, one in the morning, one in the afternoon to Kaalui, and they can go on to Honolulu on that flight, so it saves a lot of time, and of course the airport here has free parking, so they don't have to pay parking fees. And also, uh, we don't, we're not subject to uh, TSA inspections here. So that's a big advantage. They can arrive a few minutes before departure, jump on our flight, and 40 minutes later be in Kahului. Waimea is a very tight-knit community. It's not uncommon for a friend to remind you that they passed you on the road the other day and then scold you for not waving back. The Hawaiian Style Cafe is a popular gathering place in Waimea. In the old world times, it was common for breakfast to be your largest meal. Hawaiian cowboys, often working at higher elevations, needed food that would see them through their long days. Judging by the portion sizes at the Hawaiian Style Cafe, the tradition of good food and lots of it lives on here. The first people of Hawaii arrived here from distant islands. They were totally dependent on the resources available to them. No convenience stores, no supermarkets. By studying the plants Hawaiians relied on, you'll begin to understand the depths of their knowledge and learn how they manage their resources. At the Amy B. H. Greenwell Ethnobotanical Garden, you can experience what life was like for the Hawaiians through the plants they depended on for food, medicine, and building materials. We are a botanical garden, but uh, we're, we're different than the ordinary botanical garden because our, we're an ethnobotanical garden, so our, uh, our goal here is to make the connection between uh, the culture, and in this case, it's, it's a traditional Hawaiian culture, the culture of the Hawaiians in the time before Captain Cook, and the plant resources uh, that, uh, that made that culture so uh, successful. It's thought that prior to Western contact, that's before Captain Cook's arrival, there might have been up to a million Hawaiians living throughout these islands. Their agricultural techniques and a careful management of natural resources are still relevant today. Our collection includes uh, uh, the plants that were here in the time before Captain Cook. So of course there were native plants and, and you know most of the, of the land was covered with uh, native forests and um, uh, but also uh, where the Hawaiians uh, uh, lived and, and settled, uh, there were many of the plants were the plants that they had brought with them, the Polynesians brought with them when they settled the islands. Uh, that, so we call those Polynesian introductions. So <clears throat> we have both native plants and Polynesian introductions in our, um, in our collection. So examples of Polynesian introductions are things like taro and uh, sweet potatoes, sugar cane. So a lot of them are very familiar to us, but they're not 
They're not native in the sense that uh, botanists use the word that they arrived here without human help, um, but they certainly have a, a special status uh, in Hawaii and in our garden. After Western contact, it took less than a century for the native Hawaiian population to crash. Towards the latter end of the 19th century, there were less than 50,000 Hawaiians left. Poor resistance to common diseases was one factor. Ethno, uh, you know, it's, you use the same word when you talk about ethnic restaurants. It, it really is, is culture. And uh, so uh, <clears throat> we try to make that connection between culture and plants. Um, and so the, 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 the plants that, that Hawaiians use to, of course, of course they're for eating, a lot of ethnobotany uh, is concerned with, with medicinal plants, and that's a, an interest of ours here too, but for construction, for making clothing, for uh, uh, making ropes, and uh, just for all the, the things in everyday life. And, and Hawaiians were, uh, it was, well, plant, plant resources were very, very important uh, in, in Hawaiian society and uh, um, so we try to try to tell the story of those plant resources here at our garden. Mokulele owner Ron Hansen is a retired 747 captain and he learned to fly in Hawaii when he was stationed at Hickam Air Force Base on Oahu. Safety is paramount to Ron, and that's why he always has two pilots on every Mokulele flight. Daryl Grace is the general manager of Mokulele Airlines. Born and raised in Kona, Daryl never dreamed of being a pilot. As a youngster, his sister got him a ride on a small plane, and after that, he was hooked. He parlayed his football talent into a college degree and a pilot's license. Ron Hansen is not just an owner, He's a mentor to folks like Daryl and the pilots of Mokulele Airlines. Many of them will move on to larger airlines and fly multi-engine aircraft. Several of the veteran pilots at Mokulele have been there, done that, and actually prefer flying for Mokulele. If you're in Kona and looking for eateries with lots of character that serve local homestyle cooked meals, you won't be disappointed at the Monago Hotel. The Monago family has been running this unpretentious hotel since the early part of the 20th century. Its boarding house-like dining room is patronized by an eclectic and loyal clientele. Arguably, the favorite item on their menu are the pork chops. The pork is raised by a member of the family and the cooking process a trade secret. Another popular item is the fried opelu. Caught fresh in the waters off the Kona coast, this fish is a local favorite. The meals are served family style, and you'll get an assortment of side dishes depending on the season or whatever happens to be locally available. Just down the street from the Monago Hotel is the only living history coffee farm in the nation. This living farm brings the story of coffee farmers to life by depicting the lives of Japanese immigrants like the Uchida family. During the period of 1920 to 1945, we talked story with Ku'ulani Ol, the program director of the Kona Historical Society. Well, it's a um, living history farm. Uh, what that means is um, the far, it's a working farm and we have uh, farm interpreters and house interpreters and they're doing activities that would have typically been taking place um, during the 1930s so the farm has uh, a few gardens that's what the family used to sustain themselves um, activities in the home uh, you know cooking the rice um, just maintaining the home um, maintaining the crop um, those are just typical activities that uh, they would have been doing and we continue to do today to maintain the farm. The farm is about seven acres um, and we have the coffee crop, there are mac nuts and um, the gardens to maintain. There are many artifacts that were very everyday type things. 
typical of century-old farm homes back in Japan. Most elderly visitors from Japan would recognize the fireplace and other pieces as items from the distant past. The farm was acquired by uh, the Uchida family in 1913 and uh, this home actually was built in 1926, I believe. And uh, the last member of the Uchida family left here in the 90, 1990, at the time that the Historical Society was uh, able to acquire the farm. So it's a story of a Japanese immigrant family establishing here in Kona and uh, on a farm, which this is very typical of Kona. Um, Kona then and continues today. This is uh, very much uh, Kona lifestyle. The crop is coffee. Riley Yogi and Matt Ramsey are typical of frequent Hawaiian ocean users. They know that our ocean resources are facing constant pressure from an ever-growing population and other environmental factors. Riley and Matt, on their own time and dime, decided to give back by visiting Molokai and sharing their knowledge with the students of Akaula School. The day began before sunrise for Riley Yogi and Matt Ramsey. Mokulele agreed to participate in this give back gesture to Molokai. They generously provided transportation for us. Riley and Matt are recreational spear fishermen, and like most ocean users from Oahu, they recognize the limits of ocean resources on small islands with large populations. Because of this, Riley and Matt wanted to share their knowledge and learn from the folks of Molokai about a way of life that is nearly gone on Oahu. Sylvia Adams picked us up and, true to the Molokai style, immediately asked if we were hungry. A stop at Kanemitsu Bakery for breakfast set us up nicely for our session with the students of Akaula School. While Riley's getting ready, how many of you guys know all the fish in the ocean? Oh, yeah! <laughs> Do you know why there's minimum sizes and seasons? Yeah. So you might not over, um, overkill? So you don't want to overkill. Yeah, what else? Mm -hmm. <laughs> to, to avoid mating seasons. Right. So they can reproduce and have more fish. Absolutely. So there's a lot of rules that are in place. It may seem like a lot, and it may seem like there's no reason for them, but there's a lot of rules, like you were saying. Um, there's certain seasons. Uh, in the old days, they used to call them kapu. It's basically when the, the fish are breeding. So you don't want to catch all the fish when they're breeding, right? One of Akaula's school's special benefactors is Jim Gartland. Jim and his wife Carol are passionate about caring for abandoned and neglected cats. The school and this enclosure for the cats rests on the retail property the Gartlands own. Without his help and support, the school would never have made it to its 10th year. Contrary to what some folks thought, Akaula School is not a school for the wealthy or academically elite. Like many private schools, funding is always a huge challenge. The school is only alive because of the generosity of folks like the Gartlands, the commitment of parents, Akaula's staff, and founders like Victoria Newberry. We opened the school at 7 o'clock. Uh, study hall is mandatory from 8 to 8.30. Most of our students are in by 7.30, so they have an hour to finish homework that may not have gotten done the night before to get assistance with work they don't understand. Uh, instruction begins at 8.30 and then we dismiss at 3.15. So we have a longer day, same number of calendar days, in the end more school hours. We have a very broad range, we're very heterogeneous. We have everything from high achieving students to underachieving students to low achieving students and uh, pretty much everything in between. We have four seniors this year. Three of them will be going to college. One of them's going to go on mission for his church. We travel a lot with students. Uh, we're kind of known as a school that travels. And usually we try to incorporate a visit to a college or a college campus with travel so our students can get a feel for what campus is like, what, that, what college means. So I figured, I saw this segment on TV about this guy making gyotaku. And basically I figure it's not rocket science and anybody can do it, uh, it's just you gotta try it. Yeah? So that's pretty much what I did. And so I'm gonna teach you guys how, what I learned. And then if you guys catch fish or if your family catch fish or whatever, you know, then you should try it because it's not 
it's really not hard and then you have a lasting impression of that price catch, yeah? So I think there's fish on the table and then every double, table grab a fish. I think you could. Mokolele Airlines is Hawaii's favorite airline and most dependable island hopper. Climb aboard. Your adventure begins with Mokolele Airlines. Win free tickets on Mokolele. Text Mokolele to HNN 808 to enter. Mokolele Airlines, the favorite choice to island hop.